Namaste, I'm Dr. Shiram Santi from Chicago, USA, Chairman Gandhi 150 U.S. Commemorative Stamp Initiative, Vice President Gandhi Memorial, Chicago. I want to remember and uh, reiterate the significance of Wednesday, June 7, 1893 in world history. This was the day Mohandas Gandhi has experienced racial discrimination and social injustice. And this was the day what he has re reacted or responded with has changed the course of world history. This is the day the concept of Satyagraha has started. And this has sowed the seeds for fighting for civil rights against racial discrimination through non-violence. So this happened on Wednesday, June 7, 1893 at 9 p.m. at Peter Marisburg, then called Marisburg Railway Station in South Africa. I would like everyone to visit this railway station because we are all experiencing the freedom as colored people because of this incident where Gandhi has reacted with their positive influence. Thank you. Some of the excerpts from these books were presented in text form in the slides. The Mohandas Gandhi Essential Writings by John Deere and M.K. Gandhi an Autobiography by Penguin Publications in Modern Classics. Mohandas Gandhi was a spiritual seeker of truth through nonviolence. He went as a barrister in law to South Africa under the name of Mohandas. And later on, he became a Mahatma during the Indian independence struggle. Gandhi also was called an apostle of peace and nonviolence. Tawakkal Karman, a Nobel Peace Awardee in 2011 says, Peace does not just mean to stop wars. Again, peace does not just mean to stop wars, but also to stop oppression and injustice. Gandhi, a brown man, and Martin Luther King Jr., a black man by color, have experienced racial discrimination and social injustice during their lives. Gandhi, 50 years before Martin Luther King Jr. An introduction to Gandhi. Gandhi's life is called an experimental life. Gandhi's presence in the 20th century, a century that perfected the art of extermination, is strangely arresting. His life seems peculiarly unhoused in the violent landscape of his times. How, by what twist of historical fate, did this frail, ungainly man with teapot ears, whose figure wrapped in handspun cloth evoked a faded, archetypal memory of saintliness, wander into the bonden world, and how for a time did he electrify it? What was he doing there, and what can the trace of his presence mean to us today? More than 50 years after his assassination, Gandhi has become a symbol, a myth, and even a commodity. Yet, we are still far from taking the measure of 20th century's most enigmatic and remarkable personality. Confronted by the vast corpus of his writings and speeches, the character works of Mahatma Gandhi make up a hundred-volume monument. Interpreters continue to quarrel, seeing him variously as a spiritual paragon, a wily politician, a psychological and anthropological curiosity, an inventor of political techniques of nonviolence and civil disobedience and a critic of modernity. When Gandhi was asked during the Quint India movement speech, he said, my life is my message. Gandhi's most uh, quoted quotation was, my life is my message, as mentioned during the Quint India movement speech. Here is Gandhi in 1931, called as Mr. Salt in the Vegetarian Society group meeting in London. 
Here Gandhi in 1880s, during his schooling years as barrister at law in London at the Vegetarian Society in 1890. Gandhi is in the front row in a suit, formal suit, and extreme right. This is the event I want to remember, or I want everybody to remember during their lifetime. This happened, which was the eviction of Mohandas Gandhi from first class compartment by a few white personalities as color discrimination at Marisburg Station on a Wednesday, June 7, 1893 at 9 p.m. This is a, a similar picture from the movie Gandhi, where Ben Kingsley acted as Mahatma Gandhi. This is another picture from historical perspective in one of the journals from South Africa, where it shows a colored person being thrown away out of the first class compartment by the Natal government train services. Chronology of life of Mohandas Gandhi. On October 2nd, 1869, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born to Karamchand and Putri by Gandhi in Porbandar, India. In 1882, at the age of 13, Mohandas marries Kasturi by Makanji. In 1888, September 4th, he sails to London to study law. In 1891, June 11th, he is admitted to the bar and becomes a lawyer and sails back to India the next day. In May of 1893, he moves to Durban, South Africa to practice law. One week after his arrival, he is thrown off a train for refusing to move to the third class section because of his skin color and decides to spend all his energy fighting racism and injustice. In 1904, he founds a weekly newspaper, Indian Opinion, buys 100 acres near Durban and founds the Phoenix Farm, his first ashram. In 1906, September 11, gives a stirring speech at a mass meeting in Johannesburg, inspiring thousands of Indians to disobey racist laws. Professors a vow of celibacy, publishes Hind Swaraj or the Indian Home Rule calling for India's independence and return to village life. In 1908, January 10, Gandhi undergoes first arrest and first night in jail in Johannesburg and adopts the term Satyagraha and encourages the Indians to burn their registration cards. In 1909, begins correspondence with Tolstoy. In 1910, buys 1,100 acres near Johannesburg and establishes the Tolstoy farm, his second ashram. In 1913, he leads the Great March from Newcastle to Works Rust and gets arrested. In 1914, negotiates the Indian Relief Act with the South African government. July 18th, he leaves South Africa and visits England. In 1915, on January 9th, he returns to India, and this January 9th is being celebrated as Pravasi Bharat Divas. In 1969, establishes Satyagraha Ashram near Ramadabad, also called Sabarmati Ashram, and travels throughout India. This is the Marisburg Station in 1890s with a stagecoach standing in front of the station. And in 1893, such stagecoach was used by Gandhi to go to Pretoria. This was an invitation to me on this 150th celebration of birth anniversary of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi at the Marisburg Station, now called Peter Marisburg, by the Peter Marisburg Gandhi Memorial Committee which was celebrated on June 7th, 2019. This is the current station. In front of that, myself, with the mementos from the Gandhi Memorial Committee given by Mr. David Chengan. This is myself pointing to the top of the Peter Marisburg railway station in South Africa. This was a statue erected for Gandhi in the business district of Peter Marisburg. And this is a plaque which was uh, placed mentioning in the vicinity of this plaque, M.K. Gandhi was evicted from a first class compartment on the night of June 7, 1893. This incident changed the course of his life 
and he took up the fight against racial oppression and his active nonviolence started from that date. Again, June 7, 1893, when his active nonviolence has started. This is the two faced statue of Gandhi at the Peter Marisbeck Station. Uh, the one side which we are facing, which you are seeing, is the Mohandas during his stay in South Africa. The other side of the face is bespectacled Gandhi after he became Mahatma in India during the Indian independence struggle. This is the picture on the day of June 7, uh, 2019, when, as, when I was offering my homage to Mahatma Gandhiji at the plaque that was erected on the Gandhi on the Peter Marsberg station platform. To my left is Mr. David Jengen. Uh, to, uh, to my right is Mr. David Jengen. To my left are uh, Ira Gandhi and uh, Mr. Prasad from Gandhi King Foundation, Hyderabad. This is a group photo at the plaque on that day uh, depicting Mr. M.P. Omi Singh, myself, Dr. Sri Ram Santi, uh, Mr. G. V. V. D. S. Prasad from Gandhi King Foundation, Hyderabad, Mr. David Jengan, President Peter Marisburg Gandhi Memorial Committee, Mrs. Sheila Gandhi, granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi, who is in charge of Gandhi Memorial Trust in Phoenix Settlement, uh, Mr. His Excellency Sri Jaydeep Sarkar, Indian High Commissioner to South Africa, Mrs. Minako Sarkar, uh, Council General Anish Rajan from Durban. Mahatma Gandhi, an apostle of nonviolence. When Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated on January 30th, 1948, the world hailed him as one of the greatest spiritual leaders, not just of the century, but of all time. He was ranked with Thoreau, Tolstoy and St. Francis, but also with Buddha, Muhammad, and even Jesus the Christ. Generations to come will scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth, so said Nobel laureate Albert Einstein after the assassination of Gandhiji. Gandhi's legacy includes the brilliantly waged struggle against institutionalized racism in South Africa, the independence movement of India, and a groundbreaking path of interreligious dialogue, but it also boasts the first widespread application of nonviolence as the most powerful tool for positive social change. As this is nonviolence as the most powerful tool for positive social change. He named it Satyagraha. Gandhi's nonviolence was not simply political. It was rooted and grounded in the spiritual, which is why he exploded beyond India's political stage and onto the world stage for his own lifetime and for all times. Gandhi was first and foremost a religious man in search of God. For more than 50 years, he pursued truth, proclaiming that the best way to discover truth is through the practice of active, faith-based nonviolence. That is active, faith-based nonviolence. Someone was asked, and as you read through Gandhiji's writings and biographies, Gandhi was asked, how to live humanly in our current inhuman world? Gandhi's answer was always the same, steadfast, persistent, dedicated, committed, patient, relentless, truthful, prayerful, loving, active nonviolence. The key words are truthful, prayerful, loving, active nonviolence. For example, a 21-year-old British student activist named Ronald Duncan wrote a pamphlet about a labor strike he organized and mailed copies to over 100 activists around the world. Only Gandhi replied, explaining that the means are the ends. He said, the means are the ends, and that all our organizing must be nonviolent to the core. Duncan responded by asking that if he could somehow visit Gandhi, and he came to Gandhi to visit him on a 23rd day of a month. And with the support of fundraising, he, Duncan, went to India and met with Gandhi. And as I was saying in my letter, Gandhi said to him, without missing a beat, means must determine the ends. And it is questionable whether there is an end, 
but the best we can do is to make sure of the method and examine our motives. That is, practicing non-violence as the means uh, towards whatever ends or noble goals we are striving for. And Gandhi always had the single-minded devotion to non-violence. And Duncan was profoundly impressed by that uh, attitude. Gandhi has always professed to, for the creation of a culture of peace, injustice, and non-violence. In other words, it is a creation of a culture of peace, justice, and non-violence. In other words, he challenges us to become prophets and apostles of non-violence. Gandhi's life in South Africa, Gandhi experimented with his life as few others have. He strived to renounce every trace of selfishness and violence within himself in a relentless pursuit of truth. While he was plumbing his own depths of non-violence, he realized that he also had to pursue the practice of non-violence as widely as possible in the public sphere in the pursuit of peace and justice for the poor. He was at once a devotedly spiritual religious person as well as an astute politician. He introduced an, an entirely new way of to organize, to run nations, and, and, and to transform cultures of violence into cultures of non-violence. Gandhi's transformation was a slow, painful process of daily renunciation, prayer, study, and radical experimentation with his own life at great personal cost. Fifty years later, a Christian minister called John R. Mart asked Gandhi what was the most transformative experience was in his life. Gandhi told the story of his first week in South Africa. He was traveling overnight by train to conduct a case in Pretoria for a local Muslim tradesman called Dada Abdullah Sheikh. He was quietly reading in a first-class compartment when a white conductor appeared at the door and ordered him to move immediately to a third-class compartment or be thrown off the train. Gandhi found himself face to face with institutionalized racism or apartheid. He refused to budge, so they beat, they beat him up and threw him off the train. He sat all night in the freezing cold on the train platform in the middle of nowhere weighing his options. He was thinking he could return to India or he could join the handful of violent revolutionaries who seek change through bloodshed or he could pursue a third path, a peaceful, prayerful, public confrontation with legalized racism until everyone's civil rights are, were honored. The third path he chose was a peaceful, prayerful public confrontation with legalized racism until everyone's civil rights were honored. The train seemed, seemed away leaving me shivering in the cold. Gandhi recalled, the creative experience comes there. I was afraid for my very life. I entered the dark waiting room. There was a white man in the room. I was afraid of him. What was my duty? I asked myself. Should I go back to India? Or should I go forward with God as my helper and face whatever was in store for me? I decided to stay and suffer. My active nonviolence began from that date, that is June 7, 1893. And God put me through the test during that very journey. And that was one of the richest experiences of my life. So said Mohandas and Mahatma Gandhi. Indians in South Africa had been denied basic civil rights including the right to vote. Gandhi organized widespread nonviolent resistance to these injustices. He defended hundreds of clients, wrote countless articles and press statements against these unjust laws, and spoke to any group that would listen. Then in 1906, the Transvaal South African government announced it was considering new legislation that would require every Indian to register with the government be fingerprinted and carry a certificate of registration at all times, and the Indian community was stunned. On September 11, uh, 1906, Gandhi called for a mass meeting in Johannesburg to protest the proposed legislation. 3,000 people filled the Empire Theater. Gandhi was not sure what he would say until one of the preliminary speakers made an offhand remark announcing that he would resist these unjust laws in the name of God. 
He said he would resist these unjust laws in the name of God, even if it meant his death. That was the answer. Gandhi stood up and declared that if everyone present took a vow of non-violent resistance to these unjust laws and remained faithful to their pledge and to God, even if they were arrested, imprisoned, tortured and killed, the struggle would be won. It was as simple as that. This was the new method of opposing injustice. So he organized a contest. Eventually, he coined the word himself called Satyagraha or truth froze. Satyagraha means resisting untruth by truthful means. Gandhi explained in a speech in 1911. It can be offered at any place, at any time, by any person, even though he may be in a minority of one. If one remains steadfast in it, in a spirit of dedication, it always brings success. Satyagraha knows neither frustration nor despair. He says, Satyagraha knows neither frustration nor despair. When the Asiatic Registration Act became law in July of 1907, Gandhi officially launched the Satyagraha campaign. On January 10, 1908, Gandhi was arrested for the first time, and the next day he was sentenced to two months of hard labor in prison. He always says, after he read Thoreau and drew the astonishing conclusion that the real road to happiness lies in going to jail and undergoing sufferings and privations there in the interest of one's country and religion. He was so inspired by the life of intentional community in a Trappist monastery outside Johannesburg. The community included prayer, simplicity, and farming that he considered farming his own religious community and farm. His reading of Ruskin's classic work until this last pushed him to do it, and in 1904, Gandhi purchased 100 acres near Durban and created the Phoenix Settlement, his first ashram. In 1910, as the movement exploded under sought to join this farm, he bought 1,100 acres near Johannesburg and founded the tallest type farm, his second ashram, which became the center of Satyagraha campaign and the support network for all political prisoners. Ashram community members grew their own food, built their own buildings, ran their own schools, pooled all their money, made their own clothes, prayed together, and shared everything in common. Gandhi set up another ashram after he came to India at Sabarmati River near Ahmedabad, where he lived for the next 16 years. Over 250 people eventually joined his community, which practiced the same austerity he originally witnessed at the Trappist Monastery in South Africa. Each member professed 14 vows, including truth, nonviolence, celibacy, poverty, fearlessness, physical labor, tolerance of all religions and making their own clothes. The three key elements are truth, nonviolence, and tolerance of all religions. They prayed together, ate together, farmed the land, and published newspapers and prepared themselves to suffer and die in the nonviolent struggle for independence. Gandhi's 12 principles of spirit of humanity included nonviolence, non-cooperation with evil as important as cooperation with good, faith in nonviolence, accept and our court suffering, prayer, radical purity of heart, living solidarity with poor and oppressed, have nothing to do with power, equality and tolerance of all religions, fearless pursuit of truth, trust in the goodness of struggle for peace, and pursue truth and nonviolence. Here is Mohandas Gandhi before he became Mahatma while he was in South Africa, where he transformed into a person of significance in the world history, a spiritual seeker. Gandhi's spiritual seeker is true spirituality. Gandhi award was not a speculation on the absolute, however profound and philosophical, nor was it a quest for personal salvation. His favorite hymn, Vaishnava Janato by Saint Narsim Mehta, began with the line, He alone is a true devotee of God, who understands the pains and sufferings of others. The divinity of man, he affirmed, manifests itself according to the extent he realizes his humanity, that is, his oneness with his countrymen. This is the song, Vaishnava Janato, Tene Kahi, 
स्पीड पर आई जाने रे गांधी ऑलवेज फॉलोड द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ सेंट कंपोजर नरसिंह मेहता ही रोट वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जी पीड पर आई जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो ये मान अभिमान न आने रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जो पीड पर आई जाने रे दीज आर हिज पेरेंट्स करमचंद गांधी टू योर लेफ्ट एंड पुत्री बाय टू द राइट मोहन सिंह Mohandas Gandhi was inspiration in childhood was his father Karamchand who was a lover of his clan truthful brave generous incorruptible and impartial and without greed and his mother Putli Bai deeply religious attended Vaishnava temple and fasting till sunrise every day and the two stories that influenced him were uh, Shravana Pitru Bhakti and his to his blind parents the loyalty to the parents and Raja Harishchandra the play practicing truthfulness during schooling he always believed in truth of not not lying when he was asked to change the spelling of of kettle where he spelled kettle by copying from the next student At attitude towards sports and physical exercise was minimal taking care of ailing father at home was the most important thing for his life vegetarianism was the important principle on diet and loyalty towards his wife kasturiba after he got married his three important inspiratory influences were from mr rai chand bhai a jain sage raskin whose book unto this last taught him the dignity of a life of a manual labor on the land and tolstoy who led him to the truth that the kingdom of god is within one and not outside rai chandra ji mahatma gandhi has written we are all worldly people whereas shrimad was not of this world we will have to take many births whereas shrimad perhaps one birth is sufficient we will perhaps be running away from liberation whereas shrimad was advancing towards liberation at a very fast pace he asked ramchandi what is a soul and what are its functions do the karmas bound it the soul in its pure conscious state that is in the state of its realization is a creator of its own inherent characteristics of knowledge perception and samadhi that is spiritual equanimity but in the state of its ignorance the soul becomes a creator of emotions like anger conceit deceit greed which are all foreign to it not only this much under the influence of these emotions soul through its instrumentality also becomes a creator of things like pot and table the karmas are actions which are done in ignorance of one's own self though in the beginning are merely seeds yet at the time of maturity they turn into trees laden with heavy fruits it is thus self evident that the soul itself has to bear the fruits of its actions just as by giving you a touch to fire you first feel it seed then pain follows similar is the state of mundane soul what is god is he the creator of universe just see you and we we are all mundane human beings bound with karmas that is our souls are in bondage of foreign matter and foreign impulses impulses the nature state of self with its intense glory free from all karmas aloof from all impurities and bondages is godhood god is endowed with the fullness of peace bliss and knowledge this godhood is the inherent nature of the self but due to ignorance born out of bondage of karmas one is unable to have a vision thereof God is not the creator of universe all the elements of nature such as atom space are eternal and uncreated they have got their own substratum they cannot be created from substances other than themselves per chance if one says that god has created them this also does not look sound because if god is a conscious being our consciousness is taken to be his characteristic then how can atoms and space etc be conceived to have been born from him what is moksha or salvation 
Moksha or salvation is the absolute liberation of self from anger, conceit, greed, and other nascent propensities, which bind the soul with earthly coils and other limitations. There is a natural urge in life to be free from all bondages and limitations. A close consideration of this urge makes the truth of the above saying of the wise men to be self-evident. And he asked about Rama and Krishna incarnations. He said they were just great personages and they were souls and they were certainly God also. If they have annihilated their bondages of karma, there can be no dispute in their having attained moksha as well. Gandhiji says the most of his lessons for self-improvement on truth and non-violence he has learned from Sri Rai Chandji. And Rai Chand Bhai is one of the three personalities that have much impressed his mind, the other two being the writings of Tolstoy and Ruskin's Unto This Last. To love the murderer is one of the maxims of non-violence, and Gandhiji had well learnt it from Srimadji, who was full of sympathy and forgiveness and piety to all living beings. Gandhiji says, I have drunk to my heart's content the nectar of religion that was offered to me by Sri Rai Chandji. And Rai Chand Bhai detested the spread of irreligion in the name of religion. And he condemned lies, hypocrisy, and such other vices which were getting a free hand in his time. He considered the whole world as his relative and his sympathy extended to all living beings of all ages. This is the Leo Tolstoy's kingdom of God is within you. He says, in this world, men should not accumulate wealth. No matter how much a evil person does to us, we should always do good to him. Such is the commandment of God and also his law. No one should take part in, in uh, fighting. Man is born to do his duty to his creator. He should therefore pay more attention to his duties than to his rights. John Ruskin has said, the exclusive quest for physical and material happiness of the majority has no sanction in divine law. In fact, some thoughtful persons in the West have pointed out that it, it is contrary to divine law to pursue happiness in violation of moral principles. Gandhi had influence through Thoreau. When Mahatma Gandhi was working out his concept of nonviolent resistance, he was impressed by Henry David Thoreau's advice to resist things that were wrong. Thoreau suggested that individuals could resist immoral government action by simply refusing to cooperate. In the great teaching of the Vedas, there is no touch of sectarianism. It is of all ages, crimes and nationalities and is the royal road for the attainment of great knowledge, so said Henry David Thoreau. A book from about uh, Martin Luther King Jr., an autobiography by Mr. Claiborne Carson. Mandela and Martin Luther King have received Nobel Peace Prize as black personalities. Cesar Chavez and La Cueleza got Nobel Peace Prize as Hispanic and non-Hispanic white personalities. Desmond Tutu and Dalai Lama as spiritual gurus got Nobel Peace Prize. White President Jimmy Carter and Black President Barack Obama have received Nobel Peace Prize, but Gandhi never received Nobel Peace Prize, and he was rejected 12 times in history because he was a colored person when he was presented for Nobel Peace Award. Time magazine has, a, has a Gandhi on its cover on March 31st, 1930, and January 5th, 1931, and June 30th, 1947. King also adorned the cover of Time magazine at, at two different occasions. Gandhi says about politics, it's only because politics encircles us, encircles us today like the coil of a snake from which one cannot get out, no matter how much one tries. I wish, therefore, to wrestle with the snake, he says. Here Mohandas Gandhi's picture in uh, Man of the Century, and uh, Mahatma, the great soul, endures in the best part of our minds, where our ideals are kept. The embodiment of human rights and the creed of nonviolence. Mohanchand Karamchand Gandhi is something else, an eccentric of complex, contradictory, and exhausting character most of us hardly know. And uh, Nelson Mandela reads about uh, Sacred Warrior, 
uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He talks about him as the liberator of South Africa himself, looks at the seminal work of liberator of India. India is Gandhi's country of birth, South Africa his country of adoption. He was both an Indian and a South African citizen. Both countries contributed to his intellectual and moral genius, and he shaped the liberatory movements in both colonial theaters. He is the archetypal anti-colonial revolutionary. His strategy of non-cooperation, his assertion that we can be dominated only if we cooperate with our dominators, and his non-violent resistance inspired anti-colonial and anti-racist movements internationally in our century. He mentions Gandhi, not, no, no ordinary leader. He was divinely inspired. He, there, were, there are those who believe he was divinely inspired, and it is difficult not to believe with them. He dared to exhort nonviolence in time when the violence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had exploded on us. He exhorted morality when science, technology, and the capitalist order had made it redundant. He replaced self-interest with group interest without minimizing the importance of self. In fact, the interdependence of the social and personal is at the heart of his philosophy. He seeks the simultaneous and interactive development of moral person and moral society. Gandhi remains today is the only complete critic of advanced industrial society. Others have criticized its totalitarianism, but not the productive apparatus. At a time when Freud was liberating sex, Gandhi was reigning in it. When Marx was pitting worker against capitalists, Gandhi was reconciling them. When the dominant European thought had dropped God and soul out of the social reckoning, he was centralizing society in God and soul. At a time when the colonized and ceased, had ceased to think and control, he dared to think and control. When the ideologies of the colonized had virtually disappeared, he revived them and empowered them with a potency that liberated and redeemed. These are some of the children of Gandhi. Dalai Lama, who was trying to liberate Tibet through nonviolent means, Lekwelaza for Poland, who created uh, a nonviolent means to remove communism for Poland. This is Rosa Parks in 1958 and uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who followed principles of nonviolence. This is Cesar Chavez in farming, uh, he created under hunger strikes. Larry Kramer for the uh, gay movement, gay and uh, lesbian movement, Aung Suu Kai for the Myanmar Revol uh, Revolution, and uh, Benino Aquino for Ferdinand Marcos. Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela in South Africa facilitated uh, uh, the uh, South Africa release from apartheid. Here, Martin Luther King on Time magazine after his Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. He says in his first book on uh, Stride Toward Freedom, my skepticism concerning the power of love gradually diminished. I came to see for the first time its potency in the area of social reform. Prior to reading Gandhi, I had about concluded that the ethics of Jesus were only effective in individual relationships. And I, came, I had come to see that the Christian doctrine of love operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence was one of the most potent weapons available to the African Americans in the struggle for freedom. Christ furnished the spirit and motivation while Gandhi furnished the method. Here is Martin Luther King Jr. with Rosa Parks. And here King's writing says, love is the greatest force in the universe. It is the heartbeat of the moral cosmos. He who loves is a participant in the being of God. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. experienced racial injustice and discrimination when a cross was burnt in front of his house. And Obama has said when he visited India, what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said then remains true today. The spirit of Gandhi is very much alive in India today, and it remains a great gift to the world. May we always live in his spirit of love and peace among all people and nations. He signed it on 25th January 2015. Barack Obama. 
Martin Luther King, as I said, he said uh, that uh, the intellectual moral satisfaction, the intellectual and moral satisfaction that I failed to con gain from the utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill, the revolutionary methods of Marx and Lenin, the social contract theory of Hobbes, the back to nature optimism of Rousseau, and the superhuman philosophy of Nietzsche I found in the nonviolent resistance philosophy of Gandhi. Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in the world. Somebody said he didn't say it exactly in the same words. He says, we but the mirror of the world. All the tendencies present in the outer world are to be found in the world of our body. If we could change ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. As a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. This is the divine mystery supreme. A wonderful thing it is and the source of happiness. We need not wait to see what others do. So it translates to be the change you want to see in the world. He also followed the philosophy, an eye for an eye, for an eye it only makes the whole world the world. This was myself in 2019 at the Peter Marisbeck Station, where Gandhi transformed himself and also the world history. This is the plaque that was erected. This is the group photo at the 2019 celebration of June 7, 1893. And this is my homage to Mahatma Gandhi, the plaque where it was erected on Peter Marisburg platform. Bibli bibliography. Bibliography. Number one, an autobiography of the story of my experiments with truth by Gandhi, 150 Navajivan Publishing House, originally published in 1927. Number two, M.K. Gandhi, an autobiography, modern classics, Penguin Publications, originally 1927 and again 1929. Number three, Mohandas Gandhi, Essential Writings with Introduction by John Deere, Arbis Books, in 2003. Number four, The Essential Gandhi, edited by Louis Fisher, prefaced by Eknad Ishwaran, Vintage Books, 1962 and 2002, and pictures from various sources collected over 30 years. Credits, Concept and Narration, Dr. Sriram Santi, MD, Advisor, Dr. Shalada Purna Santi, PhD, Videography, Yugandhar Nagesh and Swadesh Media. Editing, Yugandhar Nagesh, The Last Five Talks, Kiranmayi Sharagadam, First Talk. Production, facilitated by Sunti Renaissance International, SRI Foundation, Flossmore, Illinois, USA. Center for Gandhian Studies, Chicago, USA. Center for Telugu Studies, Chicago, USA. Gandhi 150 U.S. Commemorative Stamp Initiative, Chicago, Gandhi Memorial, Chicago. And this is from Gandhi 150 U.S. Commemorative Stamp Initiative. And be the change, Mahatma Gandhi says. Thank you for these two books for facilitating this talk. Namaste.